Hey, guess what? We're on. We're on, all, all right. right. And we're out at the lake and the river at the same time. At the same time, here we are. I'm with Richard Trest. Many know him as Richard Trest. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing good. I got a little uh, COVID uh, last week and uh, not, not very, uh, it was mild. So uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that we were able to do this. I've been wanting to do this a long time. And we are right now, we're right here by the boat ramp, Saunders Ferry, right? Saunders Ferry Park. Underneath this pavilion. So it's got a nice little echo here. You might hear some birds, airplanes landing over. They fly over us and land 20 miles away, I guess, yep. at the airport. Yeah. You got some boaters out there. Some geese, some ducks, some... All that good stuff. Some herons. I Let's, love to watch the herons fly, man. They're, they're beautiful birds, big birds. Yes, they are. And they, they can stand out here, too, in mm -hmm. some of this. Yeah. The foot and a half deep, you said. I want to see that little boy on that boat catch a big old bass while his dad's bent down. <laughs> <laughs> Probably will. Probably smack him with that hook and grab him, too. Yeah. So right on this location, Saturday, let's lead with this. All Tell right. us about your event. You've got oh, the... Oh, man. Uh, the ninth year of the Middle Tennessee Highland Games and Celtic Music Festival. And uh, we started off at the Hermitage uh, nine, well, 10 years ago, because we, uh, we took COVID off one year, you know, 20. Right, yeah. We couldn't do it, wasn't safe. But uh, we started at the Hermitage when uh, my friend Andy Ward jumped over a fire pit after drinking a couple of drams of scotch and <laughs> said that we're gonna restart the Highland Games. and. Uh, Debbie and I fell in love with the Highland Games experience. It's a little different than your typical, you know, Renaissance festival, which is usually weird. I mean, there's a lot of enactors there that, yeah. that people get weird. This is really a cultural experience because it, it, it uh, comes to our knowledge after I did some research that about 20% of Nashville is still Scotch-Irish in, in their uh, heritage. Uh -huh. And as a matter of fact, if you look at Donaldson, Davison, all of that, that's a Scottish name. They founded this town. Yeah. And so we were, we went and we got a little support from the city and stuff like that and started the games and built stages and put up tents, bought tents, hired some bands and stuff like that. And 27 people showed up first year, second year, 3,500, fourth year, third year, 4,000, and the Hermitage didn't want to do it anymore. Because they're really a museum, wow. and they're, they're beautiful grounds. I mean, they've got thousands of acres in, in Old Hickory, you know. Uh, but they uh, they didn't want to do it anymore, so we went to the parks in Nashville, and we went uh, Percy Warner, and we were there for uh, three years. And they didn't want to do it anymore because the park wanted to be more of a rural park with just jogging trails and stuff like that. And yeah. the other thing is, we lost a sheep in the third year. What, what do you a mean, Scottish out in the sheep, woods? The Scottish sheep got lost, got loose, and was in Bellevue for over two weeks. <laughs> Nobody could catch it. <laughs> and this is Scottish sheep. you got to realize Scottish animals are usually pretty hardy, okay? And this sheep was uh, running amok. It wasn't hurting anybody, but it would show up in somebody's yard. Finally, they opened a, a Facebook page called Bell U. E-W-U. E-W-U. E W yeah yeah Bell U. Sheet. okay and they followed it Pe <laughs> people would post pictures of it and, you know I wrote a song called you know a Bellevue song put it on there <laughs> and so we uh, <laughs> we had fun with that but the parks didn't really think that was too funny and we will have a uh, uh, since then we we found that uh, Hendersonville was very welcoming and we saw this park and we said man this is perfect it's it's on the on the river on the Cumberland River Old Hickory Lake um, they were very affordable. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, to us and uh, uh, actually fell in love with us. We've been here three years now. This will be our third year here and uh, been growing. Last year we had 10,000 people on two days. 10,000 people in two days. Yeah, and uh, we just have a small group that puts this together. So we had to hire a management company to help out with it. And they do the tent rental. They do the, the beer licensing. We, 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 we do sell beer. We do sell some scotch. We have scotch tastings. We have beer tasting this year. Uh, we keep adding stuff. We have, uh, I was telling you about uh, Holly Lamar, who is a, uh, went to Europe to become a falconer after writing the hit song, Breathe. For and Faith Hill. With Faith Hill. Well, she didn't write it with Faith Hill, but Faith Hill but for her. gave her a lot of money, which she lost in Europe, unfortunately. <laughs> but she came back with a passion for birds. And uh, 
she'll be out here with uh, the eagle owl is probably the most amazing bird and I've never heard of an eagle owl till Holly showed her to me this this bird stands about about three feet high about a foot and a half wide with eyes as big as golf balls it's a really? beautiful bird and uh, what she does is she lets you, puts a glove on your hand lets you take pictures with the birds and she flies we'll, we'll let her fly birds out here she just bought a Scottish peregrine falcon which is the fastest living creature on earth and living it, creature yeah living creature I don't, I don't know if there's any other creatures that can that can move 100 miles per hour horizontally and 600 miles per hour in a dive what <laughs> now you don't reckon that y'all might lose one of these fancy birds out here like y'all lost that sheep Oh uh, well, I don't know. That's up to Holly. She <laughs> raises them, and she knows she's. These birds are, are pretty amazing. I didn't realize birds could be trained like that, and I didn't also realize that that uh, you know they they form a bond with their with their birder, you know, yeah. with their falconer, and uh, so they might not come right back to you, but she has ways to you know, you swing some meat around in, in the air and they'll come get it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And Man, so, I can't wait to see this. Oh, she also has, uh, in Jolton, she, you can go out there and experience these birds. Uh, she does a bird experience. She'll have them fly to you. She'll, you can go hunting with her. She takes no these way. birds hunting. Yeah. What do they do? What, what do you mean takes the birds hunting? Do, can well, you she, explain that a little She bit? has some uh, hawks as well. Hawks are better. Uh, hawks will take squirrels. You know, they, I don't know if you, I, I've got red tail hawks in my backyard, and they, they keep them a squirrel population. So she takes the bird, the bird hunts. Right, the bird hunts. Okay, so we're she the ain't birds. hunting birds. You don't release the birds. hounds. I know you, you're a hound guy. Okay? I grew up, yeah, I, we, we went. I've we heard went. your song, you know, about the hounds. <laughs> I love it, because I'm a hound guy too. But she takes this bird out, and it'll be a squirrel, and she'll, boom, you know, and it, it'll take, take the squirrel. And then it won't bring it back to her. You know? Yeah, it ain't a bird dog. No, it ain't a bird dog. It's just no, a bird. It, it, it'll, it, it'll fly down on the ground and, you know, start and kill it, you know, and then she goes and picks it up or whatever. Wow. I don't know if she eats squirrel or not. I think she lets, she feeds the meat that they take when she does take them and feeds it to them. What, to the birds? Yeah. Yeah, why not? We hear somebody backing into the lake right now. This is like a, this is, this truck has an actual reverse sound like he's driving a UPS truck or something. But he's really? backing his boat in. Yeah. Beep. Yeah, probably so. But, I need yeah. one of those. So probably. if you hear that on the podcast, that's what we're listening to. So we are honored that you asked you asked Amy and I to come and sing the national anthem here. That's right. At this event. And we're so excited about it. And the reason for me uh, specifically is I've been wanting to come to this event for years. I've mm -hmm. known you for, oh, I'm going to say, 15, 16 years at yeah. least. And... Um, I've lived here 18 years, and I met you pretty quick when yeah. I moved here. But I've known you. We met at the at, at my cafe for uh, right. Yes, Richard's Cafe. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, funny story. I was in my truck here earlier today, and this guy comes up to the window and he says, "You used to have a place in White's Creek." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been closed five years, right? Right. You had a place in White's Creek? I said, "Yeah." I said, oh, "Yeah, Richard. I used to love that place. We went there a bunch of times. You know, the music is a good place to sit down, have dinner, listen to great music. Yeah. You know, all original, all original. That's because that's uh, why we loved it. I mean, you were the first place for n not only me, lots of songwriters who moved to Nashville to find a, a stage and a place where we could play our songs for people that were not just sitting and listening it was like a it was almost it was a family atmosphere mm -hmm. it could be rowdy at times and you yeah. let me bring my band and what yeah. was so cool is we would do one hour showcases of our original music with a full band mm -hmm. and i ended up getting i think it was every third saturday for a couple of years there and it was my favorite gig in town because we'd go in there it was like playing a bar but they were also listening. But they were they were cheering when the when the band would we'd play that rockabilly and and mm -hmm. when Lisa yeah. would slap that bass oh, and dance. And yeah, I mean, oh, Lisa, man, oh. I tell you, I just she she made our days, you know. Yeah, and I'd get up and play a little Zydeco tie. Yeah, with she'd play that tie, and yeah. we'd do a whole bit on that. And you would can you still do that bit? The, the no, I, I did it uh, the other night. Uh, I, I played at the. Um, at the uh, uh, Jeremy Dean, and you know Jeremy. I yeah. think he's a he's Great. my partner in crime. When we do two, uh, show, uh, we go down to Frank Brown Festival every year and play. Yeah, down there in uh, Orange Beach, uh, Alabama. Songwriter, yeah, songwriter, yeah, songwriter festival. festival, Frank Brown, and uh, I, he got us a gig at the uh, at the Wilson County Fair. 
Oh, okay, nice. And I don't know if you know about the Wilson County Fair, but the, the, the state fair wanted to join with them. Yeah. They've been trying for years to join with them. Wilson County said, we don't sell beer. We don't sell alcohol. Oh, okay. We're a family fair. And it took them that long, and, and Wilson, uh, the, the state fair finally was about to fold. And Wilson County said, okay, you just join with us, you know, sell alcohol, it's fine. And that's what, where we went and played. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. That's why it's called the Tennessee. Is that it's, it, They changed their name, right? It used to be Wilson County Fair. It's Now it's... I think it's a, called, called the Tennessee State Fair, but I think they still refer to it as Wilson yeah, County Yeah, I mean, Fair. I still call it Wilson County. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I got a gig at the Williamson County Fair, hmm. and you know Jerry Webb, yeah. all right, guitarist. So he, Jerry, I sent him the information to play with us, and that day he called me. He said, man, I don't see nothing. I don't see y'all anywhere. I said, where are you at? He was at the Wilson County Fair Fairgrounds, and he ended up making it to the Williamson County Fair in time. But that was that's how that's how strong uh, brand recognition of Wilson County Fair is. When you it hear is. Williamson County Fair, you just think of Wilson. They broke all attention uh, uh, attendance records this year. It wasn't for uh, because wow. of us, I'm sure. But so you're playing with Jeremy Brown, and you did the Zodico tie. I did. The, Zod- matter of fact. Because of the festival, I, I wear a kilt, okay? Okay, yeah. yeah. And I wear a kilt when I'm at this festival because I'm the president of the Middle of Tennessee Highland Games, and I have to go Scottish, right? I have to do the thing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I was I was the only one in the band with a kilt, for sure, and yeah. a Zotico tie. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> So, can you do it on the spot? Like, can you for our for our oh, listeners? Yeah, because the Zotico tie is such an amazing virtual instrument and household appliance as well. Because you can use it and to make music with. Of right. course, it makes it's good for Zotico music. It's good for any kind of percussion uh, set in any kind of music you want. Also, it's a great childhood correction device, <laughs> birthday spanking device. Bar none. Most children will be corrected with only one use of the Zotico tie for sure. And most birthday spankings with the Zotico tie will leave a mark that will last one full year to the next birthday. That's right. You can use it for signaling the train, uh, a plane for your rescue if you're lost at sea because of its shiny surface. And most men who make many fashion misstatements we can't make a fashion misstatement with Zotico tie because it goes with everything. It goes with paisley. It goes with seersucker. It goes with any color at all. And that's right. The Zotico tie is for for every man to do. I could go on and on, but uh, I won't. <laughs> I could get a little <laughs> oh, blue. Oh, <laughs> man, that's so good. So if you're wondering what is this tie, it's it's a tie that clips on, and it's like aluminum and kind of ruffled. You know? Yeah, it looks it's, like a rub board, yeah. Yeah, and so you can you can play it, you can bang it, you can do all the stuff he just said. So it, it's, it's awesome. As a matter of fact, we, when we went to the Romore house where we stayed down in Orange, uh, Orange Beach, Alabama, the, the little lady that's uh, the innkeeper there, uh, she, uh, she, she was like, admiring my tie, and I, and I gave it to her. And I, and I gave her a thing. I said, do this in the morning. Breakfast ready, bacon, eggs. And she, was, she learned how to play that Zydeco tie. I said, this will wake your guests up. They'll come and eat. Yeah, okay? no doubt. <laughs> so I gave her my last. I had to buy another one. Yeah. I sold about 250 of those during Did my... Did you really? Oh, yeah. Well... I owe you money because you handed me a, a couple of them to sell. Oh, okay. And what happened was they got destroyed. How can you destroy? Zydeco ties are destructive well, proof. Well, the packaging, they were packed in with our albums and stuff in the truck, and they got all smashed and bent and messed up. Oh, so, they undone. Yeah, yeah. I, gotta, I just got to pay you for the thing. I destroyed no, your product. No, no, no. They've doubled in price since I bought, <laughs> used to buy them for $11 each. And now they're you, online, you can't, uh, it's like 20 bucks. But Really? And then I had to buy it from Sweetwater. And you know how Sweetwater is. You can buy one string for a dollar and a half from Sweetwater, and you will get candy, and you will get a phone call. Absolutely. <laughs> Man, I, I love them. I just talked to them today, so I know, I know you're You know what about. I mean. Yeah. I bought one Zydeco tie. First thing I bought from them in five years, and they, they're my friend now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I remember Sam Ash is, of course, it's out of business now. Oh, man, that's sad. Jamie's opening a new business, though, in it, town. Really? East Nashville. Um, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, he's doing, uh, you know, vintage instruments. You can put your stuff on consignment with Jamie and his partner for 15%, oh. which is a real bargain yeah, for somebody to advertise, sell, and keep your stuff. So he's, he's well, keeping going. Well, that's good that he's got something else yeah. he's working on there. But Sam Ash is gone, you know. Yeah, I think it's gone nationwide. Yeah, nationwide. Yeah. I mean, Closed that's... all the stores. 100-year anniversary, too, which is really strange. Yeah. They, it was Wrong. like, happy 100th. We're done. Yeah, we're done. 
And I think it was just mismanagement because if you've walked in the store lately, they had all of these like, like Fender, different things, a lot of inexpensive and all of these, uh, uh, what's, what, there's a couple of different brands that have come out now that are really cheap, you know. Right. But good, good looking instruments, good print, they play pretty good too. Yeah. But they don't have any credibility in the long term really. And so I think they, they overbought some of the cheap stuff and everybody's more interested in probably collectible or, or lifetime guitars, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the beginner guitar thing, mm-hmm. if you just cater only to that, you only go so far. Right. But and, and most of their, theirs were electric beginner guitars. You know, they're coming from China. They're coming from everywhere. Yeah. Taiwan. And, and I don't have any problem with that, but, you know, if you can afford better, you get better. You know? Absolutely. Well, let's go back to... Back to the games, huh? Well, yeah, the games. And, uh, and then, you know, jump into some of your... What brought you to Nashville? I mean, that's, oh. I'd kind of like to hear a little bit of your story tied in with these games because you, well, it, well, they know I think about at the, the time games. It was like a 1965 uh, uh, Jeep. <laughs> that's what brought me to Nashville. Well, I took <laughs> I took a package from the company I worked for. Deb and I worked for the same big corporation for I worked 22 years. She worked 23 years. And uh, then, then, then she got, kept getting jobs, and you know she's just a brilliant lady. Got her, got her uh, master's degree, and uh, y'all been married how long? Uh, this will be thirty-eight years. Thirty-eight years. Mm-hmm. And now, you were in where? Where'd you start? Uh, we 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 met in Midland, Michigan, at the home office of uh, Dow Chemical, actually, and uh, we we're both very high ranked controllers you know in in that that's what i did for a living for 22 years is is the books you know and uh great company to work for after 22 years it start, start uh, after you get up to a certain level in a company the politics start hitting i didn't like it i, I you know i want to do my job and so i finally left left took a package which was really nice and it was kind of sad because i was a manager and i had to fire a lot of people along the way when they'd have packages and People didn't expect it. It, it, it got, you know, I hate doing that. And so I left that company and I was looking for something to do. I've been playing guitar since I was 16, a little rock and roll band back in high school, you know, down in Gulfport, Mississippi, you know, playing there. That's old where you grew up. Beatles and Stones and, uh, you know, all of the Herman Hermits, uh, whatever, you know. Yeah. And so I love that rock and roll. And uh, uh, so we, uh, I started coming to Nashville about 96. That's when I took the package. Came to Nashville, uh, wrote two or three songs on the way down, had two or three songs in my pocket, and we did an album. Got a couple of friends of mine to come down here. Yeah. Jay's Place, Jay oh, Vern. Yeah. Right down Jay Vernelli, you know Jay Vern? I know he's, of him. He still yeah. has that house. I know. I it pass it every day. It must be $10 million now. But. <laughs> it's down there on, you know, it's down on the end of Music Road towards Belmont, and I pass it on the golf cart, and I tell everybody about it. Yeah, and you know that sign in the front yard? Mm-hmm. That's a hand. You know who yeah. made that? Shel Silverstein. I did not know that. Shel Silverstein recorded with him, and he said when Shel, you know, and Shel Silverstein wrote or cover Rolling Stones. Boy named Boy Sue. Boy named Sue. Yeah. And so he, he designed that sign for him. The next time you look at it, you'll see yeah. that work. I will look at that. I'll mention and he, that. And he said when Shel started coming to record his studio, all of these beautiful women would show up. Because <laughs> yeah. he was Hugh Hefner's buddy. Oh, and these were Playmate wannabes. And they'd come in and they'd find out Shel Silverstein was here, you know? Whoa. <laughs> oh, Jay's place was the place. That was the hot place. If they knew Shel was there, they'd, they'd come, you know, try to hit on him, you know? Yeah. He probably had fun, you know what I mean? Uh, well, I guarantee it. <laughs> so, so you recorded an album there. I recorded an album there, uh, Simply Southern. And the first time I came down here at the CMA Award with, another, with a young lady, that, well, she wasn't young, but she was trying to, you know, country music and she, right. she invited me to be her ho- her uh escort at the cma awards and then i went there and i wore my cowboy hat you know and all that stuff it's like 97 you know and uh, i was about the only other cowboy hat there there was maybe one or two there you know well by the late 90s they were out of the hat phase uh, they were yeah they were back and in, going into caps yeah right? yeah um and so uh i i, I kind of fell in love with nashville and uh, we stayed at a place called Simply Southern, which is out there in, in Jolton, Goodlesville area, you mm-hmm. know, out in the country. And I, I wrote a song for them called Simply Southern. I very rarely play it now, but uh, it's yeah. still a good song. And, and um, 
recorded that album with a friend of mine, uh, and uh, two friends of mine came down and we recorded it. One mandolin player and one uh, my backup singer, you know. And uh, we had fun with that. And uh, I, I took it to the music row people, you know. And, and uh, back then, in the late 90s, you could still make a phone call and say, hey, can I come play you some songs? And I had three or four publishers that I could just call on a Monday Get and a say, meeting. hey, can I come down tomorrow or next day or something? i got a couple new songs. Walk in their office, wow. bring my guitar. Because back then, I was kind of on, still on tapes or something, you know. I, I didn't have a big recording system, you know, and I wasn't going to spend money on demos yeah. too much. But... Uh, so we did that, wrote a bunch of songs with a bunch of ladies, started with NSAI, you mm-hmm. know, and met some people there. And, and that, that was a really good environment back then. Uh, they had nice writer's rooms. They had a couple of girls I used to write with and uh, yeah. uh, several other people. And, and so that was good. And it, it just, uh, I, they liked my songs. They never quite made it. You know, we were talking about uh, one of the ladies out here, Holly Lamar, who, who, writes, who wrote Breathe. And uh, that's a rarity. Even back then, mm-hmm. it was kind of rare for a, a, a simple songwriter to have a song get into that mix and be on an album and be a video and yeah. be a big number one hit. I mean, massive. Massive. Amy, still, we still do that one. Do you? Amy sings it, yeah. Oh, wow. You I ought to tell love, Holly. I Holly. love that song. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so Holly will be here with her birds. We talked about that. So, uh, but, but yeah, it, and I, I just love writing songs with people. To me, it's, it, it's probably one, one of the most... Um, broadening human experiences to sit down with somebody that may be like you, maybe not like you. And, I, and by, uh, we mentioned my restaurant that I opened in uh, 2005. Yeah, how did you go from songwriter guy going to NSAI to, I'm going to start a restaurant? Because uh, that's about, what, eight years difference when you got here? Really unusual because uh, we, uh, I'm, I was born in New Orleans. Right. I had three old maid aunts, and my grandma and grandpa lived in this little two-barrel shotgun house, double-barrel shotgun house. Yeah. And the maintenance on that was, they all passed away. And the maintenance on that was eating my brother and I up. My brother and I co-owned it. And some guy came and offered us money for it, you know, and because and, it, it was going to cost us $20,000 to paint it. because they have to it? They have to put a tent over it because it had... A, uh, oh, I see. You know, all the lead in the paint. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it was very old. I mean, a hundred-something-year-old house. And it wasn't a big mansion. You know, have you ever seen a shotgun house? Yeah, it's, it's no. It's real simple. Just an old house. And, uh, I, and so we sold it. I had some money. Being an accountant, I said, if I roll that investment over, I don't have to pay taxes on it. I started, we looked all around Nashville for something, you know. And all of a sudden, I went through White's Creek and this two-story Mason building, Mason Lodge. Yeah, it was a restaurant, or, you know, a market. It's, it was a, almost 100 years old. Needed some work, and there was a bank next to it, a little bank that was no bigger than most people's living rooms. You know, I mean, it, but was it, it was, still an active bank? It wasn't. No, no, no. At it, this it time, it closed okay. years and years, and years, years ago. It wasn't nothing, but it was. It was made out of rock. I mean, it was. It was solid. Yeah. You know, it wasn't going anywhere, and the vault was still in it, which was cool. <laughs> and so, we bought it. You know, the, the people that owned it were North, uh, South Koreans, not North Koreans. Uh, <laughs> they weren't making bombs in there. Luckily, no, there wasn't bombs anywhere, whatever we know of. But uh, so they were going to get out of that business, and, and their real estate agent was a little South Korean lady, and they kept dropping the price, you know, dropping the price. And I didn't have that much money. I had, you know, like 100000 or something. Finally, they dropped the price where I could afford it, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take it, you know. Yeah. And I love doing it. Me and my friend Jack Boucher, you know Jack. Uh-huh. Uh, my <laughs> lifelong buddy, man, he's done a lot of work for me and drums for me and how harmonized with me. So he'd play every time i play at the cafe. Yeah. Well, we we redid the floor in it, you know, we did this and that. I got a new stove, not a new one, but I, I bought all kind of used equipment, opened up a restaurant because my wife said, you know, you ain't doing nothing, Richard. Why don't you open a restaurant? You got to build it. I said, okay. She claimed she didn't say that, but that's what I heard. And and called it Richard's Cafe. Richard's Cafe, because I, I I I love the way my mama cooked that Louisiana food. You know, she's a Louisiana lady. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, open it up. It took me probably a couple of years to get the supply chain because Nashville is not a Louisiana food town. Right. It's not a seafood town. No. No. I used to have to drive home to Gulfport, Mississippi, where I grew up and get shrimp, you know? Oh, look, really? White shrimp. Well, yeah, I didn't do it all the time, but, uh, you know, I'd, I'd buy two big old 50-gallon igloos full of white shrimp uh-huh. from these 
Vietnamese ladies on the in vans on the side of the road. Yeah. And the grandma would take my coolers home that night, take her heads off the shrimp, and put them in the ice for me, and I'd take them back up to Nashville. Wow. Freeze some, cook some. That's why the shrimp was so good. Yeah, it Go was. Mississippi shrimp, you can't beat them. And then I uh, found a, a, a company, a little seafood company opened up in town, and they had redfish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and black and redfish. I mean, yeah. nothing better, and it was not that expensive, so I started buying that, and and I got I, when I'd go home to Gulfport, I'd also get the boudin, you know, and the andouille, all those good Cajun treats, yeah. you know, and bring them back up and cook with them and all that, and develop my cooking. Hired a bunch of local curmudgeons, you know, to in there and work. And some of my waitresses were just insane, <laughs> and you know, Crystal was one of my favorite ones, you yeah, know, and she I, was a singer songwriter too, right. and it was kind of fun. Uh, and uh, we just we just made a business out of it. We weren't a bar, you know. We we did no. sell beer. I did get a beer license, but I didn't really want to mess with a liquor license, you know. Our uh-huh. wine license was separate back then. Now you can do both. But uh, yeah, so we got a beat of beer eventually, you know. Mm-hmm. And we got some of the Louisiana stuff. We got community coffee, and so yeah. it turned into a, a fairly authentic Louisiana restaurant, which is not. I don't know. There's any left in in Nashville now. There's one I mean, in Goodlitzville. What do you what do you Land think yaps. about do you do you know about like Gumbo Brothers down in in the Gulch? Have you heard of that? I have, one? I, I've heard of them. I haven't been there. I, I hear they're from Baton Rouge. They might. So be. I don't know if they're anything close to what you had going on, but maybe you should probably bigger. I check mean, I, I, I don't I know. never uh, I never aspired to be a restaurant tour. I had too much fun with the music side of things. Yeah, I didn't overcharge anything. And back then it was, you know. You weren't making any money from I what I made. I never made any money, but I made money when I sold the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got you. Because this is another interesting part of it, because after, right before I bought it, a couple of guys bought the, the Fontenelle, Barbara Mandrell's yeah. 27,000 foot uh, log cabin. <laughs> Just kind of a back across the, in the woods, across in the, the woods, across, yeah, you know, not restaurant. even a half, a quarter mile from my place, you know, and these guys happen to be Dale Morris, who, uh, run the Morris agency, which is Kenny Chesney, Alabama at the time. And Mark Oswald was the other, uh, partner in it. And he was Alabama's man, manager for their entire career. The, yeah. the day they changed their name, the gig in, in Los Angeles, I think it was, or it might have been in, in Las Vegas, that they became Alabama because they weren't initially Alabama. What was their initial name? You remember? The boys. I think of it was Southern something. something. I don't even remember. Yeah. yeah. They, they had a first name, but they changed their name to Alabama when he became their manager and he managed them for their whole career. And I met him. I met some of the Alabama guys. I met so many guys through was it the, Wasn't he involved with um, Big and Rich too? Big and Rich, Gretchen Wilson. Yeah, yeah. that. The, the music mafia. The music mafia. He was. And I, they'd all occasionally they'd come out there, and of course Sammy Kershaw lived in the neighborhood. He'd Kenny come out there from Music Mafia, from Big and Rich. Mm-hmm. He he gave me. I remember it might have been at the Fontenelle, but I thought it was at your restaurant anyway. He he gave us it's my first fifty dollar tip. I think in Nashville, he walked up and dropped a nice nice bill in there. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. all right, we're coming along. We here. had some of those things happen at my place because, like I said, it was out of the way. And a lot of, back then it wasn't, Nashville wasn't Nashville, like no. it is today. Nashville was a little cow town and no, downtown was no big deal, you know? Right. You could park on Broadway, you know, yeah. if you circle the block enough times. Yeah. And, uh, but my place was, you could be, you could dress the way you wanted, you could show up, you know, and get fed and, and have a beer and, uh, and, and people it, were what? just so relaxed about it, you know? And so, so we did have Big and Rich show up every once in a while. And then, then Kid Rock buys in the neighborhood. Oh. Oh, you're good. Kid Rock buys in the neighborhood, and he started coming down, you know, and that was that was fun. And John Pardee got to be his buddy, and he started coming down. And then Steve Smith, who owns Tootsie's, and most of the other bars yeah. downtown, it seems like, he started coming down there. And so we'd have a little late-night sessions down there, and it was uh-huh. kind of – I felt really cool about it. But, you know, I found out something about, you know – Mark Oswald, not so bad. He's he's just really a down to earth guy. But but a lot of the big stars, you know, uh, big and rich and all that stuff, they know me. I know them. You know, I've I met them enough time to where if I walked in the room and say Richard, you know, that's how yes. you know me about Richard. But they breathe different air than us. Yeah. I can't afford to keep up with them. <laughs> I see. I've been invited to a lot of good parties and and had a lot of good you know good times with those guys. You know, and. Uh, it, it, it's just. What do you mean? It, it costs too much to keep hanging. 
Yeah. Uh, you or know, what do you mean words, the toll it takes on you? Just the way they live or, or the late nights? What is it? Yeah, they, they just, you know, they have entourages that, that they follow. And I'm not an entourage guy, you know. I, I kind of like to know people like you and I face-to-face, person-to-person. And, and Bobby and I, uh, Kid Rock Bobby, and I got yeah. to know each other pretty well. He invited me up. I wrote a song with him and all that kind of stuff. And he's, he's a decent guy. Right. But he's also a star. And yeah. stars have to be stars, you yeah. know, and they have to do star stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and they have to throw big parties occasionally, and they have to do this and that and the other. And I just felt like that's not my world, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm too much of a down-to-earth guy from a down-to-earth family in, in Mississippi, you know, and I just like being where I am, you know. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, um, one of uh, Corey Gearman, I don't know if you ever met Corey, but he's, he was uh, Kid Rock's uh, manager, still is, his, his personal manager. And he and I got to be good friends and stuff like that. And he said, Richard, if you sell this restaurant, you know, Kid Rock's not, not going to be around you anymore. You know, it's just, you know, you lose that connection. Really? Yeah. He warned you about that? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't care, you know. I mean, you know, what the heck, you know. Lose a friend. And I didn't lose a friend, you know. Right. Occasionally I'll, I'll, I might know he's having a party downtown and Debbie and I will go down there and he'll see us and invite us in the in the upstairs room or something yeah. like that. And you got to realize that, that stars like him and other people like that, a lot of their parties are not, are not what you'd think, like Hollywood parties or something, you know, where you got lights and champagne fountains and, you know, dancing girls and all this stuff. Yeah. It, you know, he's, he's more, uh, Kid Rock came here to be country, I think. You know? Is it more of a networking gathering? For them, you think you think it's kind of like it's under the. We're calling it a party, but really, yeah. this is going to result in business. I hope I don't get edited, but you know, it's bullshit sessions. <laughs> no, you know, I Jamie Johnson comes up. I'm drinking a beer, and you know, they start bullshitting about them smoking a joint at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. No, this you is know? The, and, this and, is uh, what the podcast needs, Richard. We need. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, okay, you know. It's just these, these stories that they tell, that these, these things that happen in their, you know, star life, you know, that yeah. they, get behind, they get, you know, you got to realize when you're that level of a star, Jamie Johnson, Kid Rock, you know, Big and Rich and stuff like that, you can, they can walk in any place and they'll let them in and they'll yeah. give them stuff, you know, yeah. you know, oh, oh, let me buy you dinner, you know, and, and uh, you know, that's not me. You know? Well, think about like the, you just mentioned the White House and stars. I just was reading the story on Elvis going in the White House with guns. Yeah, and unloaded them right there and laid them out. They didn't even know he had them. He said, "Oh yeah, here." And he gave President Nixon a gun, had it on his person. You know, like, really? What in the seventies? Well, the way Jamie Johnson tells his story, he's got this this joint in his pocket. Yeah, because he wanted to do that. He wanted to tell the world that he got to do that. <laughs> And he goes up to the to the entry, you know, place, right. and 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 uh, the guards look at him and start patting him down and pats his pocket and he said he looks at him and he says he said you don't want to know what that is he said he said he said he said it's okay <laughs> they let him in now How you try that, that today no oh no that that's amazing. <laughs> unless you're a gay transvestite oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's that. We'll definitely not edit that one. No, no. well, I, mean, that's I don't great. hate gay trans. No, no, I know it. No, I know no. it. Well, this is just this is fascinating. And so, you this restaurant though was a real network. By the way, I'm looking at four deer crossing the road. Oh yeah, you got to be careful going out of here too. We we lost a couple last year. Yeah, them deer. Yeah, so one little six point buck, not worth it. By the way, whatever happened to the lost sheep? Oh, the lost sheep? Yeah, how did that story end? Finally, the park rangers, one, a couple of the park rangers finally, you know, got word that he was in somebody's backyard and they tackled him down and the, <laughs> and the owner came and got him. Okay, all right. And it's the same owner that we'll have out here this weekend. With okay. The sheep. We will have a sheep and a coo. You ever seen a, a Scottish coo? No, what is that? It looks like a shaggy dog, but it's a, a, a coo. Oh, a cow. okay. Yeah. And they're beautiful I, animals. I think I've seen pictures of them. I'm oh, yeah. excited about this. Now, I was trained to play guitar. Well, I took lessons from my great-grandpa. Really? He raised me. Well, right. He didn't raise me. I was raised around him. Mm-hmm. He's a McCurdy. A McCurdy. All right. So he's very Irish in his background. And then I'm a Pope from Wales, mm-hmm. where our right. people trace back in the 1700s. But beyond that, I just always, I didn't think beyond my North Carolina upbringing, really, as far as my bloodline. And that's so, a heavy Celtic environment there. 
Yeah, so I'm kind of, I'm fascinated to be here and and really it'll, I think it'll get my wheels turning and maybe lead me researching this more because I don't well, know anything. They'll, they'll help you with it. Matter of fact, they'll love you to join their clan once they. And 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 one of the things you got to know about when I say clan, everybody, oh, you know, <laughs> no, it, you know, it's, it spelled with a C, and we call them <laughs> Scottish family clans, is the way I like to say it because it kind of. Mm, diminishes that shock reaction. Uh, well, not we'll have 50 of, 52 of them out here this year. 52? 52 Scottish families. Wow, and they okay. put up tents. They put up their family crest. They put up all of their... Some of them make whiskey. I felt well, Clan Bell, he'll be here this year, yeah. I think. Bell Helicopters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Guess what? Taco Bell. No way. Yes. It was founded by the Bells. Really? It's amazing. <laughs> and he, too, he, he showed me the articles, you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, it wasn't a Mexican that founded Taco Bell. Is it Bell South it a, maybe, too? I don't know. Maybe Bell yeah, South. Bell South yeah. and, and that, that Bell South. And when you look at the Scottish contribution to technology and to industry, it's heavy. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, and then, uh, you know, it, it, it's just really fun. And what they, what they have within those clans, what they call SEPTs, S-E-P-T, and it's kind of like the English version of a surf yeah. around these castles and we've been to Scotland three times and these these old these castles are hundreds and hundreds and some of them almost a thousand years some of them thousands of years old you know mm-hmm. and uh, they uh, these these seps were the families that would farm the lands that would work the horses that would do whatever the king of the castle um. needed them to do the king would provide protection from them from marauding tribes like okay. the Campbells Campbells were always stealing cattle. <laughs> Campbells? <laughs> and soup people. I that guess they're soup people. I guess they are. Uh, but uh, uh, The Campbells were stealing cows? No, oh, is this a real they story? As the, uh, as, uh, you know, you get hear this around these kind of, and they're not campfires, but it's, it's that kind of environment. It's like walking into one of these clan tents. is like walking into a campfire and sitting down and talking to these people about yeah. the history of their family. <laughs> and, and what they have is a chart up there, and, and if you're, you may be a sept of that. My granny was a gill. And my family okay. always said, oh, well, she's from royalty, you know. That, but <laughs> that, I followed, followed that back one night. I stayed up to like 3 or 4 in the morning, you know, going back in history on Ancestry.com, you know, uh-huh. looking at this stuff, you know, and going googly-eyed. Yeah. I, found, I went back to B.C., and some of that you can't trust, but it's kind of fun to do that. Yeah. But McGill comes, gill comes from McGill. That comes from McGilvery. And so that's, I've got a new uh, kilt this year. Kilt is a, a, a man's garment. Right. It's not a skirt. If no. it was a skirt, I'd be wearing panties under it, and I don't wear panties. Uh, so it's... <laughs> well, my understanding, <laughs> if you're going to authentically wear a kilt, you got, you got a free, free you're hang a commando, little bit. Aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of guys out here, that, some of the older guys, that you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just I told this to lady the other day I, when I when I was at the fa- at the uh, at the fair I had my kilt on and, and oh she said she said oh that's nice she said she said uh, I said what do you wear under it I said no this was on channel two one of the oh okay they, they were they were uh, pulling my microphone off and this is uh, she said uh, she said I hear y'all you know like you said you know you know what you wear under a kilt is nothing and I said I said well let me tell you this story this Scott this lady asked the Scottish fellow that one day and he said well why don't you reach under and see. <laughs> And so she reaches under the kilt, and she pulls her hand back. She says, oh, that's gross. And he says, if you reach under again, it'll grow some more. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, there's a lot of kilt stories like that. Yeah. You know? But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun tracing your family history back. And, and uh, the, the septs of each of the clans will be listed. And Gil is actually a, a sept of uh, Clan Donald. And that's who uh, Debbie and I initially uh, joined Clan Donald and uh, would hang out with them and go to the festivals with them and stuff like that. And so it's kind of fun to, to celebrate that and understand that. And then when you look at the, the aspects of the Scottish culture, the bagpipes, and mm. another culture like that. And you do, you do know that bagpipes, uh, most of the service organizations have bagpipes. Yeah. Well, you now, can you, do you know that connection? Because I don't know. I, I, as a matter of fact, I'm so ignorant on this. I didn't know that. Were they the only people that did the bagpipe? That, that's well, they're there's, the originators. There's, there's a um, uh, a uh, Irish version. That's a, uh, it's a bagpipe, but it's played differently. Okay. You know, it, and uh, so when we see it with the service and stuff, is that the Scottish origin? 
Scottish version Oregon. Of That's it. right. As a matter of fact, we will have the uh, Border Patrol bagpipe band wow. out here this year. We had them last year too, and they loved it. Man. We can't. They can't. We can't charge them. To, well, they can't pay to come, and they can't win a prize. <laughs> they do it as service. This is their, and they'll come from all over the border. Place. Patrol bagpipe. What? Yeah, there'll be there'll be one from California, one from Canada, one from. What are they doing hanging out in the border playing the bagpipes? So what, what do they do when they're not? Are they are they would, patrol? Do they do that all day long? No, I don't <laughs> think so. That'll work. That would might be keep. Them. That'd be a lot of work blowing the pipes all day. I long. mean, that might keep them out. Yeah, yeah. and oh. it's drum. You know, I mean, it's not just the pipes; it's drums too. It's you the know? whole band, I mean, like drums band. and bagpipes. Drums and bagpipes. So how how did they get into? These service uh, well, it's, it's a tradition, and we do have one of the uh, old, uh, oldest Scottish uh, organizations that'll be out here uh, that 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 kind of uh, accentuate that. But the the reality is, is during a war, during a battle, the bagpipes would scare the crap out of the enemy. You got to realize, you hear three or four or five coming out yeah. of the woods. Okay, you don't know what that is. <laughs> I mean, you know, and so uh, they. In Scotland, the bagpipes are kept in the armory. Okay. okay they, every, every division has a bagpipe, bagpipe and drum band, and uh, they, keep, they don't keep the drums in the... I don't think they keep the drums in the armory, but the bagpipes are kept in the armory. Yeah. So everybody's in there grabbing guns, and one guy grabs a bagpipe, and they go fight. I would be the bagpipe guy. I know <laughs> if I was in that world, that, that's where I would have, they'd have stuck me on that. Yeah, and it's, there's, there's a lot of that. You know, uh, there's, there's some Scottish bands that, uh, you know, play the bagpipes too. Yeah. And uh, one of these days we might get the Red Hot Chili Pipers. There's a band <laughs> called that in California. And uh, that'd be that's fun to have name. that here. That's a great name. How creative. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that, that we'll have 220, 200 and... 30 bagpipe and drums on the field at one time after you sing the national anthem with Amy. We'll have it. You, it, it I can't wait. You'll to hear, hear it. it. You'll hear it in Oh Hickory, I'm sure. You know, it's yeah. crazy. And uh, I'm going to, the thing that I'm, I always get worked up a little bit over doing the national anthem. We don't do it a lot, but when we do, I mean, first of all, I think my wife is just a great yeah, singer. Yeah, she's, she's the talented one. She, well, exactly. <laughs> and so to have her out front doing this stuff now has been a thrill I, for me. I've enjoyed watching that for years because, you know, yeah. I, I knew you for a long time. I knew, and Amy, would, would she'd sit there, come into restaurants, sit there back with the kids and just, you know, smile. And she's so such a soft person. She's just yeah. such, a, such a kind, gentle, wonderful person. And, and uh and even when she sings, she's like that too. Yeah, she, she's Alison Krauss. I mean, that's that, that's that's who she absolutely. is. Absolutely, you know. So to 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 be able to experience these things with her, as, as a matter of fact, do you, do you know the first time we that I know of that we did the national anthem was we had I think done it maybe I almost forget when we did it, but we at least knew that we could do it. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's about it. Years had gone by, and we played a rodeo last year about a year ago and we were loading up getting ready to pull out of there and the rodeo people ran out and said hey before you leave our national anthem singer is sick can't make it can you come sing it in 10 minutes had you been playing there we had been doing a gig outside of the rodeo just playing country music out Mm -hmm. there well we're packing up we're about to leave and we still had our clothes on Mm -hmm. so we said all right cool so we just follow this person and i grabbed a guitar and i don't even know what key or are we going to do this in and so we're standing in a, a little a cow pen you know a little horse <laughs> pen or whatever for the rodeo and we're standing in this dirt fresh dirt here and mm-hmm. i'm just like hitting the cord i'm like do you think this will work i'm like just sing you know do you, how do you and she goes yeah oh say okay so she's like really no rehearsal mm-hmm. and they hand us one mic mm-hmm. and we walk out in the middle and there's four or five thousand people here yeah and i th- i told her before she sang i said listen if you get bogged down and forget the lyrics maybe i'll remember them so hold the mic between here us, yeah. between us and that way you know it will just sing it in unison well she starts singing and i'm she's nailing it Mm-hmm. And I'm getting kind of emotional to listen to it. Well, then uh, I, no, it, it's an emotional song when you, you know. I jumped up on the harmony on the end of it because she was nailing it, and I probably messed up the harmony. But all I know, all I remember is just the end of this song. 
course, everybody's cheering for the country, you know, the patriotic mm-hmm. feeling in the building and all that. Yeah. And we're walking off there, and I'm just sort of basking in this moment. Like, yeah. this is so amazing. And we get over there where the kids are, and Amy, in the midst of all this cheering and hooping and hollering fireworks and everything going on, she looks at me and says, do you think we should get them food now or later? <laughs> Point to the kids. She's back to being a mom, you know, know, right away. And I'm just like, hey, do you know, you, you just did that like a rock star. Do you know what that was? Yeah. Well, you'll be in front of probably 8,000 people on this athletic oh, wow. field, uh Saturday at well, noon. And, uh, well, I, now I'm too nervous to do it. I can't do it. But no, Amy, it. she's great. Well, last year was really, really, because I, I, I depended on this lady to do it, and and, and she came to me at last minute she said i'm hoarse but my my friend can sing it but she's she needs the words in front of her she's a little unsure oh, so i had to go out there hold a microphone while she held her phone and that just doesn't oh no that just doesn't real good so it went, but let me tell you the first the second year i had met john carter cash and at then time his his fiance anna christina I don't yeah know, I, I know of her and no uh, of her but yeah yeah and so uh, he's a really good guy, you know. He, he's, he's a little weird, you know. I guess his dad probably was too, but he, he's, he's off center. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's really, you know. But he, there again, kind of like talking about all these big-time professionals. Right. You know, you, you grow up around that, and you're going to be a little weird. Yeah, you, know? you can't help it. But he, we, had, we sat at a table at the Fontenelle and ate dinner while they did some stuff, you know, and talked, and I said, you know, uh, uh, I hear your dad from uh, it was Scotch Irish, you know. He said, "Yeah, yeah." John was, you know, mm-hmm. proud of that. And he said, "I said, uh, would you mind? Uh, could it, could Anna Christina come sing our national anthem?" He said, "Well, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that." You know, they show up uh, right. Hit Trey, his 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 handler. You know, I had to get you know I have to communicate through him. You know, and so Trey calls me. He said, "Okay, we're coming in." I said, "Okay, I'll meet you at the gate." You know, kind of thing and all that kind of stuff. And so they come out to the field. This is our early, this is at the Hermitage. This is our second year. Yeah. I was using some uh, battery operated PA system. And, you know, and, and uh, so they, I'm kind of doing the announcing at that time. And like my daughter says, Dad, you shouldn't drink so much kosh before you announce. <laughs> that was, I was learning stuff a little bit, you know, because all these families want me to drink with them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we don't do that that much out here. There's a little bit uh, a more governed. Uh, alcohol okay. consumption yeah. process out here. Luckily, you know we don't want for drunks. But I was, you know, just feeling no hey, pain. Hey, it's a Scotch Irish. It's festival. Scotch Irish. So what you know. do you know? You're not going to drink milk all day. <laughs> and so uh, I, 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 I announced, okay, and Anna Christina will sing our national anthem. Mm. Oh, the it battery died. died. No. And I said, Anna, I said, have another one of these on the other side of the field. It'll take me about five or ten minutes. And John Carter wearing his dad's kilt. Okay, which looked like it just Whoa. came out of a back in the attic, a uh, box in the attic. It was wrinkled, it was <laughs> tattered, okay. you know, and he had it on, though. He was there, you know. He said, Anna, and this is before they were married, you know, and he said, Anna, get out there and sing the song. And she steps out on the edge of this field like this big, you know, and she starts singing, Oh, say, can you see? And she's got this, she's an operatic singer. She's a yeah. wonderful voice. Uh-huh. And she, after, after about two lines, Every one of the Scots and guests around the family starts singing with them. Wow. And man, it just, you know, I still get chills remembering that. You know? Wow. Yeah. So it was turned out to be a moment. That was a moment, you know. Speed, I mean, we are got, we've got helicopters and trucks all around us, and yeah. they're probably hearing it. I just oh. really like watching that, that dad and his two kids fishing. Yeah, we yeah. can hear them out there. They're, uh, the kids are getting excited. Yeah. They're out there talking. It is. Yeah. Good men. They're not just fishing. No, they're not just fishing. That's, that's a good a, idea for a song right there. It's yeah. more than just fishing. As by the way, I, I want to talk about um you've you've got some songs I've always loved. Um Wish Well Spent. Mm-hmm. I, there's first of all, there's just so many songs that you would play with your band when I would pop in and maybe we'd be playing the same night. It seemed like we played the same night oh, a yeah. lot at the restaurant. Oh yeah. And that's a cherry bomb. I always love oh, that. Oh, Cherry one. Bomb. Have yeah. you done that one lately? Oh, yeah. I love playing that song. Oh, it's a... rock and roll. You yeah, know, it takes man. me back. And, and, you know, the thing about it is, is that I've got some songs that because of my age, you know, I know things. I, I know words that, like a Cherry Bomb. You tell, what, what is Cherry Bomb? Well, it was a muffler, okay? Yeah. And you know, you know that. You were an auto guy. You know, uh-huh. you were, you worked as a... As I a, worked at them 
you know, carts, carts places. Yeah. yeah, parts pope, huh? Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I did too. I grew up fixing cars. My dad was an aircraft mechanic. My first car was a 1961 Falcon station wagon. And before my dad would, would let me have that car to drive, I had to rebuild a motor in it by hand. And no YouTube. Take the pistons out, put the new rings in. He wanted me to know how that worked. Wow, before you could drive it. Mm-hmm. What's missing now with the, do you, have you noticed the generation that, the younger generation now don't even care to drive? They don't even care about cars? Well, it's scary. Hey, it's, it's hardly affordable for a lot of young people, you know? Yeah. And uh, you start your career and, and, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you just buy a beater, you know, or something that you drive if you can afford that. Because the insurance costs money, the gas costs money, you know, repair and maintenance costs money and all that stuff. You know, I've got a daughter that, that you know, uh, Deb's, Deb's daughter, my stepdaughter, Laura, she, she had leukemia. Mm-hmm. And so she's still got a lot of problems with growths and stuff, some cancerous stuff that she, we've had to deal with. And we love her to death. And she works, tries to get as many hours she can at Kroger's, yeah. you know, and, and stuff. And, and they're not real, you know, I mean, she's, she's a hard worker, but she's, you know, she's affected, you know, by that yeah. chemotherapy back when and you talk about Therapy, chemotherapy in the 70s mm. that had to be you know raw hammer on the head kind of stuff you know i mean that that probably nasty chemicals but uh right. you know she, I, we buy i you know about every four or five years i find an old beater car and buy for you know i make sure it's okay and and all that kind of stuff but she can't afford it you know i mean yeah and, and uh there's a lot of people like that and then, and then there's a lot of people who don't care i, I was uh, I was uh, some. I went. We're down in Orange Beach, and I was talking to this guy in a jacuzzi, just me and him. And he he lives in New Orleans. And I, I said, uh, and he's talking about his kid. And I said, Well, your kid, 14 years old, is he, is he ready to drive? He says, I said, No, I've got a 21 year old. They don't drive. You don't drive in New Orleans. You know, it's yeah, just that's it's what too I mean. dangerous. You can't and parking. You can't afford to park. You know? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. There's just so many things, and so I understand what's happening. Uh, There's it, logical it, reasons for it, but it takes out the thrill. Like, there used to be a thrill to turn 16, oh. get your license, and then, you know, you never, even the car you started with, I had a, I had an 88 Mercury Cougar. Mm. It wasn't a great car, but it got, was that's my... That's one of my songs. It was my car, man. You know, it, I, I put a radio, a CD player in it. I got, you know, this was 2000. My son does that, Ben. Oh, yeah? Oh, he, he matter of fact, he's working on it. He's going to change the dash out and put a digital... Yeah. radio in my in my truck nice he yeah. does stuff like I that like your truck. i bought him he's he's uh, doing landscaping now he, he's got a, a landscape science degree from uh, ut and uh, he's been working at bates nursery okay a long yeah. time but i hate to see him do that because there's no there's no i say there's no future in it but there's no growth there's no you can do as be, you could be killing everything you know doing the best sales doing the best customer service where you have you can't be the boss mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and so he's starting his own landscape company yeah. and i bought him a toyota Toyota Tacoma. Yeah. Okay. Good he trucks. loves Toyotas. Yeah. And the thing is, is that I, I found one, and I said, well, I'll, I'll invest in your, you know, business. I'll buy this for you, and you know, and we found one that was really nice, like a 2018 or 17 or something. He didn't want that. He wanted an older one. Mm, yeah. So he could work on it. Yeah, and I like that. Already, ones. he's already messed with the transmission and all this stuff he's done to it put, yeah. the, put the dash kit in it with the new radio and stuff you know and seat co- seat covers you know and all this stuff he yeah. just loves doing that and my son Jeremy that lives in Fort Worth is kind of the same way you know he loves cars he's not as much but he loves building things and they're flipping houses now him and his wife his wife's a real estate agent and he he's a finance guy but he he loves flipping houses you know it seems like all the all the musicians that I know that are happy and healthy they have real jobs where they're making money <laughs> right you know and they're doing music and, and writing and stuff but boy i tell you what playing i've been doing all these bars and writing and but you know after a while i'm still doing joyride golf cart tours mm-hmm. but there was a stretch there where i was only doing music and it took its toll man because i was like i needed to get back into real work mm-hmm. not that that ain't real but mm-hmm. I was making enough to sustain my family. My wife's a stay-at-home mom. Right. She's homeschooling our kids. That way she's available. We can travel and play. Right. And it was like, on one hand, we were living the dream, and on the other hand, I was so stressed. Right. And I'm still dealing with that a bit now. You know, you're, I'm in the gig economy. I'm Basically, everything I do, I'm going to get $100 plus tips. Yeah. And I'm trying to do that multiple times a day. 
and definitely not complaining. It's the life I chose. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting to a point now where I'm seeing the guys that have other things that they're really good at, they've invested in, whether it's investments, Mm -hmm. flipping houses, whatever. Yeah. And I'm realizing I need to expand my thinking. And they show up at night and enjoy the hobby because unless you're at that A-list kind of thing in music business, you're not going to make a living. you got to supplement. Yeah. Well, you know know who has pulled it off? And, And I'll interview her here soon, Debbie Horton. Is that? Yeah. That show... She has been doing that show for over 20 years, making a good living, selling mm-hmm. theaters, because she figured out a workaround. She right. named a show, Branson on the Road. She put it in theaters, and she worked so hard to build her clientele and booked, booked herself. Booking, yeah, that's the hardest part. You know, and she's gotten over all those hurdles just out of sheer determination and, and strong work ethic. And, and so I see and stories she's like that. a talented that. musician on yeah, top well, she, of all and that, she, and she recognized talent in people. Right, so she knew how to put a team together and keep it minimal too, not overspend with for mm-hmm. a seven piece band. She could do it all with a three piece. That was a great show, y'all did the uh, John Cass experience. Yeah, you went and saw that. That's right. You were you were up in um, Kentucky when we played up yeah. there, Owensboro, and that was a great time. Got to go backstage and everything. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, that I just come off that six months ago. That was a wild experience. Oh, you know my fiddle player friend who I've written some really good songs with, uh, Lacey Carpenter? Yeah, Lacey. she's great. She's, she's, a, she's just everywhere. She loves to get her picture and say, she's just, and, and she's really good. Pic- and I love writing with her because she'll just come in there and just start telling me her life story or telling me what happened today. And I'm just over there. You know how I am. I'm writing down yeah. stuff and making notes and putting it together. And we've got some really good songs. Um, and uh, she uh, just got a gig with a rock and roll group. She's going to play wow. rock and roll fiddles. That's you know, cool. Not the, not the wood fiddle, the metal fiddle, you know. She's going to yeah. be doing that. And they, and they bought her outfits, black outfits and stuff like that. And they're, they're going to be doing heavy metal rock and roll. Hey, those big cover band, I don't know if they're a cover band or not. But oh, yeah. I, I, those big cover shows, that's real money in that. Yeah, and, because and, people love the, love the old music, let's face it. You know, and this is a lot of ACDC and stuff like that. And that's cool. That she's yeah. gonna, and she's got a good stage presence. I know that's going to oh, do, yeah. she's oh, gonna do it, well. What's really tough is is being on stage with her at like the writer's nights. And I still do do those, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and, and I sometimes wonder, oh, do I really want to do that again, you know, but I just love that environment. I love the people that are doing it. I love Debbie Champion and, and, and uh, Lee Ruskin, you know, Lee Ruskin, you know, uh-huh. and, yeah. and those are just, they're just decent people. They love songwriters and you meet people at those things, you know, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But when we go to those, We'll be playing a song, and all of a sudden she'll start she'll start dancing and playing the fiddle like crazy, you know. And I do the same thing with my harmonica. Yeah, you, you do. Know? So I'm over here, you know. Right. You know. So you we bring the energy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to bring the energy, and you know, a lot of these writers' nights, you, especially the early oh, yeah. three on, on three on a stools, you know, it's it, ballad after ballad, and maybe they got a funny song, but I don't know what they're singing about, you know, and, and all uh-huh. that stuff, and it's just kind of boring. And just to be with her on stage, just kind of like I know we're going to get some, we're going to going to get some buzz going, you know. And well, I, I want to thank you. You've you've invited me to Bluebird quite a few times over the years, yeah. and I got to say, you know, I early on I I passed the audition thing and I got my own round years and years ago and stuff, but then it kind of phased out of it and, yeah. and fell out of it pretty quick. But the times I've played it in recent years have been with you, and you had so many people you could have picked, and so just. Just want to say thank you for those yeah. opportunities. I wish we could do that again. It's kind of got like now when oh, I call is. them. Now when I call them, it's kind of like uh, who are you going to bring? Used to the eighty nine, I asked me. You know, right. now it's like who are you going to bring? And I said, well, I'll, I'll put it together. You got you got to bring some you got to bring some hits writers. Right. Yeah, you know, that's what they're I'm looking saying, for to have your own round. And I'm saying, oh well, you know, I'm not going to beat my head against that. I love the Bluebird. It was a I had I ran there from two thousand two to last year. I mean that's a pretty good run. That's a really good run. Yeah, and and like I said, I, with you, yeah, that was always fun with you doing that, and and you've got some crazy songs, and that's what I like about you. You know, <laughs> you've got you've got the voice for for that good old country style. You know, the Johnny Cash show was a a, a factor of that. I mean, you you yeah. can do that. Yeah, I love that. But but every song that, uh, that that you and I have written together or started writing, we got a couple of them that I, that I don't think are finished. Yeah, but, we need to we, we need to get back. We there's. We've should, we should have written more over the years than we have. I, I don't know what's... 
Or if it is distance, you know, distance you like to say, oh, I want to drive an hour, an hour and a half, and then back and forth and stuff. Well, like we got that. I, that. I still to this day play the the one the one that has stuck around. It with, I do it all the time. Highway Man. Oh, that's a great. That song. We wrote you, and, and and you really helped me make that a song that was fun because I came in one day thinking I want to write a song just about this guy that works on the highway, and that's all right. I thought of. And you took it to another level when we when you said the Highway Man. Like the highway man, the 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 legendary country band, and yeah. so we brought that element in. It without, I I think I've asked you this before. Wasn't that the last song written in the at cafe the, at, the, at the place? Yeah, because it you closed it really. Either it was already closed or fixing to be closed. Yeah, I think it was already closed because I closed it before I closed on the deal. Right, and, and then we me. got together in there and yeah. wrote, and it just felt like such a wonderful last experience oh, in that song. room. And then after we finished the song. I hear your recording of it, and you added these four tr- four cover licks in it from yeah. each of the highwaymen and took it to a whole nother level. Well, and I try to do that. I played it the other night at a writer's night. Did you? And, I, and it's hard for me to play it because, you know, I'm trying to follow you. And I, 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 can't, I can't change that D fast enough. You know, you do that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah it's like, it's like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm stuck in that, that one two-chord loop, and, and, you know, so it, it, I'm still learning the song, to be really? honest with you. Yeah. But I, I love it so much, and I, I think it's good. And, and maybe, the other, maybe the other two, you know, when, when Willie and, and Chris die, maybe it'll be a bigger song. Well, maybe, <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is I got held up on it. I started tracking it, uh-huh. and it's just a little... Kind of a, a another story on your your character, the way you do things behind the scenes. Like I, I started tracking it, and it was right after COVID, and just money was really tight. Mm-hmm. And you and I had communicated over the song, and well, I'll finish it when I can. You know, I'm trying to save some. You said, "Bring what you got down here to." I've got some time at a studio, mm-hmm. and you generously, Mark Dreyer, invested. <laughs> Yeah, you 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 had paid for the studio time, and I came down with these tracks, and Mark got them all lined up and got them going, Amazing. and and we knocked it out, and it sounds awesome, and 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 then you wouldn't even let me pay you back for this, and then I couldn't pay Mark because he said well, you'd I didn't already pay paid. for the banjo work and all that stuff because Lisa's on the bass on that. Band. Yeah, I mean I'd had some tracking done, but it was it was so cool to have that finished and then get in there. Mark had really good ideas about adding those extra vocal layers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And Mark is is an amazing guy. I just did a little demo over there with him a couple of weeks ago, and his power went out. We were just he just you know he he writes writes the track uh, the the, the chart sheets up you know yeah. Uh, a number chart. Yeah. And he, he always does that. And he can add, you have to stop him sometime because he plays mandolin, he plays bass. The last song he, he put a, he's got, he doesn't play banjo, but he's got a guitar banjo, you know. One oh, of yeah, yeah. Strings. And ganjo. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and so he, it's almost like, stop. We got enough in there. <laughs> you know, oh, Hammond B3. Come on, let me do that. He's, he's, the, he's a musician. With the and toys. he plays with and everybody. And he can play them all. And you yeah. talk about those those musicians that that I admire that aren't the you know stuff like like uh, Tim Watson and his son yes. TJ. Uh-huh. And TJ got his real estate license and started selling houses. I don't even still does that, but he plays. He I saw the other day that he played. I don't know how many. He plays every day downtown, and he's now leading his own band. You know, playing guitar and playing wow. harmonica. He's a great harmonica player as well. TJ, yeah, man, no, he's he's a good. Guy. I don't I don't know TJ. I've met Tim. Tim is unbelievable. Yeah, and he's in with Kid Rock too, ain't he? He hangs he's out. He's played with Kid Rock. He, he, you know, anybody that wants that. And 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 there again, he's this flashy. You know, he's got a beard, wears overalls all the time. You know, and dances. Yeah. Do you know he played on the uh, uh, General Jackson? Oh, I didn't paddle know. wheeler for twenty two years with Mark. I did not know that. Yeah, Mark yeah. was in his band. Yeah, that, you know, and. Uh, uh, he used to do splits with the fi- you know playing the fiddle, and he'd jump up and, and land land between two chairs with splits. Oh, really? Yeah, he was, he was just a performer. Him. Yeah. And see, that's that's the thing. A lot of songwriters, uh, you have to decide at some point. And when I first came to Nashville, I said, "Are you are you want to be a writer or an artist?" And I didn't I didn't understand that question. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's a real good question. Because a lot of people in the back of the head, they got this fantasy of being an artist. Right. You know, having one of their songs get real popular, and all of a sudden they're Jamie Johnson on stage, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I don't know, you know. And so I, I decided not too long ago that I love playing. I love playing in a band, you know. Like I said, I played at the uh, county fair, the Wilson County Fair, with, with my kilt on and my Zydeco tie, dancing around, playing harmonica, you know. And it was just it was just fun. You're such a, a warm spirit, and you jump on stage and you always light up the room all the time. I and mean, you've, you've always had that quality. You, I can imagine you were doing that when you were a teenager. You had that same thing going on. Oh, yeah. I remember playing at Keesler Air Force Base, you know, when I was 16, you know. I remember my first tip. Really? We were playing at this pavilion out there for this, this is some, one of the Keesler groups, you know, the air, airmen and their families or whatever. And my little band was playing and playing and playing. And at the time, I had a 12-string uh, electric. I've since bought another wow. one. Wow. Yeah, Kingston, which okay. is, was a crappy guitar, but it, it made a lot of noise, okay? And yeah. I was having fun. And the uh, guy wanted us to play Long Tall Texan. And we were playing Beatles and Stones and rock and roll, you know, right. all this stuff. And I said, I, I know that. Boom, 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 boom. You know, played it. I think we sang the first verse over and over and over again, you know, or whatever yeah. it is. And he gave us $5. Five dollars. Now, what year was this? This think? was in 1968. $5 was, was probably like 100 now. I just don't even think. <laughs> I, I have a hard time placing you in that era because you're so current to me, you yeah. know, in my life. I, and at that just 68 yeah. seems like. Way before your time. It's yeah, sometimes I think time is, is, a, is a, 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 a poor re- measure of relationship. Mm. You know, that, that an age is, is a poor measure of how, who you can relate to. That's true, yeah. And I, and I, 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 and I sense it. You, you're you're, a, you're a, a funny, yet, yet calming, yet interesting guy, you know. And uh, I think that you pull that off your family man and I, I admire that too and you know i am too yeah and i've got a little grandson here in in town now which right. is really wonderful and uh yeah it, it it's one of those things that I, I find that it doesn't matter to me i mean i've written with people from from probably a dozen different countries you know yeah. australia london i got one of my be- fe- be- favorite songs is uh, a box of knives it's a great song with a guy from london outside of london yeah. a rocker and we and he and we talked about okay, you know, he had played at my restaurant, you know, and he he was trying to test Nashville. You know, everybody wants to come to Nashville at least once if they're a right. musician or songwriter, especially. Yeah. And I he played at my place. I said, "Come out tomorrow, we'll write." You know, okay. You know, so he uh, came out to my place and wrote, and uh, I said, "Let's figure out what we need to write about because." We live in different worlds, different countries, different periods. Mm-hmm. You're, you're half my age, or not. he's a little older than that, but about half my age. And I said, no. and I, I thought of it, I said, how about kitchen drawers, you know? How about that junk drawer you got at your house? And he, oh, yeah, we got one of those at my house. You know, he's a family guy, you know? And I, oh, yeah. yeah. And so that evolved to a box of knives. How it got to that point, I don't know. <laughs> Which is just great, because, I mean, to, to think that's relatable overseas. Yeah. And of course, some a lot of times when I'm writing people like that, you know, if they're not a, a experienced writer, especially when you and I've written, uh, you know, it, it's tip tat tip tat tip tat. We're, we're both adding and subtracting and adding and subtracting. And a lot of times when I'm writing with it, and he, he he's a, more of a rock writer and not hadn't written that much, is the fact that. I kind of take the lead in it, and so it's my voice that you hear. Mm-hmm. You know, it's my ideas. You know, yeah. And so I, after we finished the song, he said, "That's a, that's a damn good song, but not in my wheelhouse." <laughs> in that song, how yeah. that works, yeah. yeah. But it's, if he wasn't it's in the a great room, song it, for you, yeah, we wrote song, and and so if if he didn't come in that day and write that, that song would never been written. Well, probably who's who's going to know it had been written. I did record it at Cinderella. Oh, I, yes, I, I love that. Yeah. Did you, did you ever put that stuff out that you did at Cinderella? Like, is it available? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, YouTube. You remind or me, I owe a lot of people that. I I I, I did take uh, 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 Disco Kid, Dis, Disco Kid. What's the name of it? Disco Kid. Disco you, Distro. Distro. Yeah. Kid. Uh-huh. And you can put your songs after you record and put your songs out there and then they'll plug them into all the different right. um, media sites you know and so uh, I, and I have put some out on YouTube matter of fact Jeremy Dean puts a lot of the stuff when we perform on YouTube so uh, you can find uh, Richard Trest on YouTube and yeah it's just you know 50 different songs or something yeah. out there you know and I've got a couple of videos I got a video of uh, of uh, 
uh, <laughs> Hoo Hoo Hoo, which is a funny ass song. Uh, I don't know if I've heard that one. Oh man, there's a video out there because it, it, as a matter of fact, I played it at the Bluebird one night and I wrote a song called with a guy at the Fontenelle, Steve, um, uh, Steve Mitchell, that's another guy I wrote with. Uh, and, 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 uh, his, we were starting to write this song about a, a little old uh, train town, you know, uh, that, that's, that's running out of gas, you know, and it's, it's becoming a, a ghost town or something like that. And all of a sudden his phone rang. He said, Richard, I got to take this. This is my, this is my grandma. She's fixing to go in for a, 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 not a serious, but a little operation. And she, I'm a grandma's boy. She, I need to talk to him. And when he hung up, I said, we're going to write that song, Grandma's Boy. Mm. And we wrote that song about a week later. This little lady, four foot nine of her, was out there at a, an event out at the Fontenelle, and uh, she introduced her grandson in the front row. Oh, this is my grandson. He's a grandma's boy. And he heard that, and he, and he was one of the hosts for the event, and he said, Miss Brenda, Brenda Lee. He said, Miss wow. Brenda, he said, uh, we just wrote that song called Grandma's Boy. She, she, and she, she said, well, Steve, why don't y'all come do a house concert at my house? And he said, he said, yeah, we'll do it. So he called me and he invited one other girl, and we went and did a house concert at Brenda Lee's house for her family and neighbors. What? Wow. <laughs> Just and from that. I, you know, she was watching me the whole time, and I'm playing all original stuff, and she's over there doing that. And you know that song, Honky Tonk Fairy Tale? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I played song. that song, and the family was laughing because it's got some funny lines in it, you know. Uh, I wrote that with... Uh, hooked up with with uh, georgia and uh and and it was it's just a funny song you know and everybody's laughing and i got the right line and i said and they you know and i said uh i think the last line is i can't remember what, what the next last line is but i said uh, i was at the end of the song and everybody started clapping and brenda lee puts her hands out like that to the side and nods at me and i have a tag on that song and they live tackily ever after she knew there was a tag coming she knew she could feel in the she song the tag it. coming. Because maybe maybe I was looking like you know she's was, a performer. She sees that in you. Oh yeah. yeah. And then, so she came to the Bluebird with Steve when I did the Bluebird round. Wow. And I don't think you were in that round. Huh. No, you. you know, no, that's that's awesome. And uh, I got Steve to come up and play that song. One yeah. song. He was my special guest, and she was sitting at a table not you know ten feet away from me watching me, and I put on a monkey mask. <laughs> You know, with the with a mouth, ugly ass mask. You know, it's got got a mouth hole that's big. You know, and all that kind of stuff. My beard sticking out from under. You know. Yeah. And I sing hoo hoo hoo, and and I get in the middle of that song. I looked over there. She's going. She's, she's shaking it. That's <laughs> I know good. she was digging it because it's a funny song. I, yeah. Uh, it's a monkey song. We we did a video on that. It's crazy. It's a. I need to look that up. Yeah. So, if, before we. Wind her down, as we're winding her down, mm-hmm. do you have any stories you want to share on the way out here? Like something that just stands out? Uh, song you song you wrote with somebody, something funny, crazy that happened, crazy Nashville. Would it, because before I before we, <laughs> I got a lot of little funny stories from the restaurant. You know that yeah, this, I was, this little insight. I remember one day this 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 uh, came from the Fontenelle, it, oh hit country writer. You know. And uh, he was going to come play on the stage, you know. His guitar was like, you remember where my, where my uh, beer chest was in the very front, yeah. kind of a cooler glass front on it? Uh-huh. And he had put his guitar case down there, and he was drunker than Cooter's Goat. I don't know yeah. what he was drinking, because I didn't sell, you know, hard liquor, just beer. And so uh, <laughs> I was sitting there watching him. He opened up the case, and he fell down and next to the guitar case like this and rolled, rolled next to the guitar, <laughs> took the guitar, lay it on his back on my, right in the front, of the front door of the cafe. Yeah. Takes the guitar out of there and starts tuning it on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of those things you yeah, say. Oh, you'll never forget this. the sight of that. Well, you know, that restaurant, man, it was such an amazing place for so many years. people to grow into. I mean, as a performer, I started figuring out what worked there. Mm-hmm. For me personally, and I know that I'm not the only one. And then I met so many other people and writers, between besides yourself, the mm-hmm. other people that would come in and out, and we become friends. And from there, yeah, have and, relationships, and you get some fan base built there too. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, is that 
You know, it wasn't like the bluebird. The thing about the bluebird is that everybody's listening to every word you say, every song you sing. Right. You know, so you play your best lyrical song. You know, like, like I say, Wish Well Spent. You know, that's got some really cool lines in it. And it Great. It's a story, but it's a story song. You kind of have to follow it. Yes. Bluebird, that works. It does. At most clubs, at most venues. It don't. It like don't right. work. You got to have this big punchy chorus line that comes out at you, you know, and stuff. People yeah. can sing along, you know, like that. Uh, but uh, at, at, at our cafe, there'd be people talking over here. There'd be kids running around. So, you know, you kind of, like you said, you kind of realize what works, what doesn't work, you know, and stuff uh, like that. And, and it, it just... It, well, yeah, it was a good opportunity to to learn about my own stuff. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you could play covers out and you knew what worked there. But right. you can never figure out your own stuff in a live setting that was good enough for just average people, consumers mm -hmm. that want to just... Yeah, and you know your uh, your uh, your your funny songs always hit 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 well. I, that's probably what what attracted me to you you the most is you know it's kind of like my brother. What's the name of that song? Uh, you left me for my brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, did, do you know that song got cut? Really, James Carruthers. Really, he he lives not too far from here, and he's over, he's on the road with Alan Jackson on his final tour, and James. Heard me do that at the palace one night, mm -hmm. and I had just, I had never, I hadn't done it in years. Well, I go to the palace, and I'm sitting there with him, and we're just playing songs on a Tuesday night. And I said, well, here's one I, <coughs> I sent to a bluegrass band earlier, pitched it to them, and they never responded to me. They asked for songs. I sent them that, and they just mm -hmm. never said a word. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, that they never said anything to me. They, they're probably trying to understand that what the, why I would ever send this song to them. They, they're probably too good for this song. Or whatever. I, said, so, I made a joke <laughs> yeah. like that. Sometimes you feel it, but you don't know. No, you don't know. But I made a joke, a little off-the-cuff joke. Well, he, he heard it. He fell off the bar still laughing. <laughs> he went and cut it. He said, could you send me that demo? I sent it to him, and he cut it in like a week and never said anything to me. And, and right at the last second, he said something to me, and he put it out. And... uh I never would have thought you left me for my brother got cut. That's that, that's funny. You know, yeah, you never. Know. He does, he's got a killer version of it too. I tell you what, it, it's way better than any version I could put together. I don't ever. know because you know when you and I've heard you do that so many times. There's sometimes when you do it, it's just like you say, everybody is just falling off their chairs laughing. It's just it's right. how, how you time every line, you know. And like you said, I I can do the same song over and over again, you know. Like I I, I love the song. I got in trouble at the Bluebird. I didn't get in trouble. This guy sent me a letter from Kentucky. He must have been a, a old primitive Baptist guy when I played. I met Jesus. He runs a honky -tonk. in a honky tonk. Yes. Yeah, and, and so he he took offense to me singing a song about Jesus in a honky tonk at the Bluebird Cafe. Well, a, whole, a, a full page letter about it. You know, really? Trying to save my soul. And so I it, huh. I thought about it and I changed two lines in the song because of that. Now when I play it, it's I met Jesus. He runs a honky tonk. <laughs> You know, felt fed me with it, but the yeah. whole idea of the song is the fact. And I always tell this before I play it. I, I tell him a story about about this guy writing me a letter, and I said, uh, I, I say, you know, uh, I believe that Jesus Jesus loved everybody. That that's that's not a that's that's not an understatement, you know. And and I and I think that he he would be at ease in a bar as he would in a church. He might be more at ease in a bar. You know, if you look at the people yeah. he hung out with, there was some riffraff in his, his right. group of 12, you know? <laughs> yeah. And and, uh, and and so I changed that line, and the other line in it was, uh, uh, was instead of uh, 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 with a little holy water on a bar rag, it's water on a holy bar rag. Real, it's I got you. Little, little, it's a different. <laughs> that actually does. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good change. <laughs> I Maybe gotta take, keep you from I gotta take a, a picture and send this to Mark. All right. got, Mark drives asking me how I'm feeling. <laughs> oh, is he? Well, you know what? We're, we care care about each other. You know, I mean, it, that's the thing about the Nashville. The, the 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 writer, not the hit writer, music row writers, not you know the big stars and all that stuff, but the people that are contributing to the music at the at the home fire level. You know what I mean? It, it's just it, it's just the relationships there are. are are wonderful you know we just lost lost a, a couple of guys you know you lose them every once in a while that you, you've played with and all mm -hmm. and uh it, it uh yeah it, it it's 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 uh 
It's been a pleasure. This is this is kind of fun talking with you. We to do this more often. Well, thank you for for being on my little old show, mm-hmm. and uh, looking forward to being a part of this event this weekend. Yeah, singing the national anthem. Put so. that out there and tell people. And uh, of course, we're a little afraid because the weather is going to be amazing. Sixty three in the morning, seventy eight in the afternoon. No rain. We're going to have no rain. We're going to have. It might be ten thousand people out here tomorrow. I mean Saturday. Golly. And I, I, you know, it's a big park, and we know we, we're spread out. But well, there's been at least a thousand planes and boats and <laughs> trucks go by. So if you've heard all that, we appreciate you for hanging in there and listening to the show. And uh, go Richard see Adam Pope, when you can get see where he's playing, man, he's he's uh, he's a performer. And if you hit the hit 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 with him and Amy, I can't go to North Carolina. I'll be going that weekend. Somewhere. Oh, I wish you could. Though. Yeah, yeah. I, I love to hear. hear well, we'll, we'll do something. We're going to do something here pretty soon in Gallatin. So okay, we'll be announcing that. But yeah. thanks for being on the show, Richard. Thank you.